What's up? I'm Dan Fradenberg, and this is another Chance Encounter. Cujo uh, Virgil, is that how you pronounce it? Yep, Yannick Cujo Virgil, yes. Excellent, and how are you doing today? I'm good, I'm good, I can't complain. Can't complain, the, uh, the sun is shining, so can't complain at all. Excellent, that's the spirit, and I'm happy because I've got my very favorite audience member here today. And why is my favorite audience member here today? Well, it's because this is a chance encounter where I interview commercial real estate investors. Now, why do I do that? Part of it's because it's the law. You have to get to know people who are in your industry and doing the same thing so that you can collaborate with them. And I need to know, it's like, all right, are we a good fit or not? But I also go through the entire commercial real estate deal in this little condensed format so that you understand how the business works and how my guest actually fits into that business. So before we get into that though, uh, Yana, can you please uh, uh, introduce yourself to the audience? Yeah, so a really quick introduction. Um, my name is Yannick Kuja Virgil. Um, I'm a real estate syndicator based in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, we primarily focus on multifamily acquisitions. And uh, before real estate, I was uh, blessed to be in the NFL, played for the Tennessee Titans. And unfortunately, I had a career-ending knee injury that shortened my career. But you know, luckily, I stumbled upon this wonderful book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and it completely changed my mindset about money about saving as you know um you know within three years nfl players are broke right mm -hmm. and so part of that you know on one end was to uh you know help myself retain a lot of the income that i've been able to uh achieve in the nfl but then also provide a resource to other nfl players and professional athletes um, that would allow them to retain you know income that they've created from the uh professional athlete space Excellent, excellent. It's good stuff. So let's start off with the motivation section, which is not that one. I knew I was going to do this. There it is here. And I'm not going to try and do the other screen share thing, get that out of my way. Let's go through the motivations. I always go through the motivation first because sometimes I interview newbies to commercial real estate and they'll know why they're doing it, but they won't know what they're going to be doing. So let's go through those first. The first motivation for people to pick up their next commercial deal is because they're trying to preserve their purchasing power. That sounds very similar to what you're up to, Yannick, because, you know, being a professional athlete, getting a nice goose egg to start with, but just so that you understand what it means. There are people out there who the only way that they make money is from the cash flow that comes from their assets. So they don't have a day job, but there's a problem. When inflation rears its ugly head, the only fix is to make another acquisition so that you can stave off inflation. So that's one motivation that's uh, pretty popular. It's not really my one though. My big one is trading time directly for wealth. I'm a high earner as far as a regular, not famous person goes. Being from tech, I got a background in CRMs and I owned a, 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 I own a CRM agency. But the problem with making a bunch of money in the form of salary or wages is that you're paying more tax than anybody else. And it hit me as like, well, if the idea is you make a bunch of money and then you invest it in things and then you get a bunch of equity and that's what you're really, that's the name of the game, then, well, what if you just skip the step and then you just work specifically for the equity and build that instead? So that's what I'm up to. But most people want to say that they want to fast track retirement or they want to take control of their time. And uh, the, there are a few things that are implied about that. It, it's, you know, they want to uh, maybe it's work fewer hours per month or fewer hours per week or fewer, you know, uh, months per year, whatever it is. But the main thing is that uh, uh, they don't want to be doing it forever. Maybe they want to move someplace where the cost of living is low and that way being an accredited investor would be plenty 
plenty. But the next two groups, they're never going to quit. The next one, they're just playing ambitious. So they want to buy their entire hometown. There's just no limit. They, they're looking for generational wealth. They want to make sure that their great grandchildren never have to hold down a day job. Okay, so that's that's the next motivation. And the last one, they're also going to be hustling into their 90s, just like the ambitious ones. But these ones here, I like to say that they're trying to save the world. But some people pick a sector of society, or maybe it's animals, or maybe it's the environment. Who knows what it is, but they realize that uh, having those financial assets to make that impact, it's, it's, it's absolutely vital to the entire scene. So, so Yannick, uh, uh, how about you? Out of those five different motivations, what, uh, what's your take on what describes you best? No, no, I, I think all of them, you know, put together with this, you know, a little piece out of every single one of those would probably... Uh, create who I am today. But I would say, you know, the biggest thing for me is just that time and wealth freedom, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, the time that you have that real estate allows you to get through cash flow to, you know, quit your job or to take that vacation or to not necessarily rely on money, which really drives, <laughs> drives us all, right? We get up every single day, we chase money. Money is a part of every single aspect within our ecosystem. And so it controls us. But now with real estate investing, you know, we take control back of time because time is actually a finite resource, right? We can't, we don't have unlimited time. So um, I think that's the biggest motivational factor for me is to, you know, create that time um, freedom and then also the wealth factor over time as we continuously grow our real estate assets and we pass that on for generation to generations to come right so now not only are we buying our time back but we're also buying our kids time back and their kids and their kids and so everyone's going to have so much time <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. good stuff good stuff i love it so the next part here i'm going to go through the motivation and uh let's get that right here with this okay so that looks all weird i'll do it like that so i'm i've got a, i've got a visual effect it's not actually a crystal cube i've got here but this is the dan does deals commercial roll dial die and you can get your copy for free at dan does and i don't even ask for your email address which is the worst thing you can do as a marketer but i really want you to be able to efficiently and effectively communicate on the topic of commercial real estate, which is why I always like to put it all in perspective with my guests. So let's go through these. So the first job is the repositioner and the repositioner, you know, they're looking at a bunch of different properties, they're doing a bunch of paperwork and what are they doing? Well, first of all, they're gonna use a fancy word. They're gonna do something called underwriting. And that just means doing the math. The first thing, cause the repositioner is an acquisitions person. So they're finding properties. So the first thing they need to do is do the math and say, hey, is this property actually making the amount of money that the seller says it is? That's the first thing. And then the second thing is they're going, okay, well, how can we reposition the property so that we have more upside? In other words, how can we make this property make more money than it is right now? There are a few different ways. There are a few different tools in their tool belt, really three as far as I'm concerned. First one's more advantageous lending. But the next one that's a little bit more obvious is the operator piece. So I got all these Benjamins going down the toilet here, but uh, there's more to operations than just unclogging toilets and cleaning up trash and mowing lawns and all that kind of fun stuff. There's also a marketing piece, which is one of my fortes. And the reason for the marketing is to keep the vacancy rate low, but uh, there's also bookkeeping. There's several different operating pieces. And uh, if you can cut those expenses, then it's making more that's your upside. The second piece, well, I guess now it's the third piece because I mentioned the more advantageous lending. The other tool in the repositioner's tool belt is to get a contractor team and make the place nicer. And then that way people will pay more in rent with a smile on their face. And that is pure upside. But if you are the type of repositioner that I am and you're from the internet, then you're going to need a local. You're going to need boots on the ground, somebody who can be there in an hour or two, because that's not going to be me. I don't even want to have to find my passport in an hour or two. So if you lined all these people in a row and said to the tenants, hey, who are all those people? They'd probably say, oh, well, they're the owners, but it's not that simple. Of course, the financiers, the banks are going to be involved. Sometimes it's the fund managers, all that sort of stuff. And if you turn around to the financiers, the banks and say, okay, so I got my property, here's my team, all that kind of stuff. Your financier is still going to want to know one thing that I haven't mentioned yet, which is who's your KP, who's your sponsor. 
And what that's all about is if, even if you're Derek Jeter, or Elon Musk, and I don't know who it is, somebody with a ton of money, if you want to buy, uh, let's say 150 unit, 350 unit apartment complex, whatever it is, and you wanna get a loan, you have to have somebody in the fold who already owns a similar asset, okay? Or else you're just not eligible for the loan. You also need a certain amount of liquidity and you also have to have a balance sheet among the, the co-sponsors that's uh, at least the amount of the loan. But if you've got all those pieces, you've got yourself a commercial real estate deal. So Yannick, as far as core competencies, what are you looking to contribute to your next deal? Yeah, I would say from the operational side, um, you know, my background is in asset management. I've worked for uh, institutional private equity firms, uh, retail capital as well. And so, you know, my background allowed me to leverage a lot of the, the um, expertise that I've developed over time into my own business. And with, within the asset management space, that's exactly what you do, right? You go out there and you implement the business plan. You're the person that's kind of putting a lot of pieces together. And luckily, you know, I've taken a lot of that uh, training from the sport world as well, right? You know, my background is I'm used to being a captain. I'm used, used to being the guy that everyone looks to, right, to, to lead the team to victory. So, um, you know, I believe, you know, all athletes, you know, whether it's, you know, collegiate or professional, they all have some sort of CEO DNA, right? They know how to take, you know, a group of people, you know, who have different interests and bring them together to get that uh, long-term goal or that big goal, which hopefully is a championship, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So I would say, you know, on my on my end, you know, my biggest contribution to a general partnership is the operational side of things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Beautiful. And uh, my next question then, uh, it has to do with your ideal property. And when commercial investors are talking to each other about an ideal property, they might say, what's your buy box? And what they're talking about, it's, I like to say it's three and a half things. The first one they're going to want to know about is the geography. Where is it? Okay, so what state? What county maybe even what neighborhood is it in that is all going to be super duper important you know location 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 second thing is the uh, the unit count now we're always talking about commercial real estate on this show and uh, if you're talking about industrial or warehousing then sure you're going to be talking about square footage but in general it doesn't matter if it's multifamily or retail or self-storage there's going to be a unit count and so that's the other thing that everybody's going to need to know the third thing i said three and a half the third, it's actually two different things with the exact same name. They're called the class. The first version of what class means is the condition of the building, including how old it is. Like, is it old and beat up or is it brand spanking new and immaculate? OK, so that's one version of class. But the second part of class is to uh, the area that the actual building is in as far as like the schools, uh, the school districts that are uh, that it's in or the crime rate, those sorts of things. So Yannick, as far as properties that uh, get you all excited, it's easier to say yes, and it's more difficult to say no, uh, what you looking for? Yeah, so as properties, uh, you know, our, our profile right now is identifying workforce housing in markets that are developing, right? So we've identified uh, a few markets in Baltimore, the Baltimore metro area, that we really like that we understand the uh, really the core dynamics of what it takes to invest into a, a really good market, right? And that's either job growth, population growth, or income growth. And we found that you know those three things or those those three characteristics are the foundation to really good markets, right? If we take a look at any market across the U.S., you know, let's talk about markets in the Sun Dome, whether it's Texas or you know those markets really display strong fundamentals. So. You know, what we look for is, you know, in the in the 100 to 75 unit range where we can uh, not be with the big guys where, you know, there's a ton of competition, and a ton of capital. You know, we're more so in kind of like the middle market uh, space. And so we've been able to win deals in that particular space and then also, um, you know, find good deals and good markets as well. That makes sense from a risk adjusted perspective. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great, great. So the next question, and really for me, it has to do with uh, my favorite part about commercial real estate, which is that 
uh, because it's multifaceted, you've got all these different players that are involved and nobody, especially like once the deal gets bigger, nobody's going to be all the sides of the deal for like any amount of time, really. Uh, but it also means that we are better suited to help some people in commercial real estate than others. So, so for you personally, uh, I'm not sure what it is. We'll get that in a second. I want to mention, I'm always looking for KPs and sponsors just because of my marketing and tech background. So like that way you'd have some systems in place where I can really be more effective. So they're the people who I can help more than anybody else. Uh, Yannick, I don't want you to break any uh, SEC restrictions if you have any 506B projects on it. So no enticing investors, whatever that means. But uh, uh, as far as uh, the person who you are better suited to help, uh, uh, you know, is it beginners? Is it intermediate? Like, uh, what role is it? Like, who 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 should really re reach out to you where you can disproportionately help them? Yeah, I would say anyone that's looking for you know a strong operator to to uh, take the business plan to completion. Um, you know, as I mentioned, my my background in asset management and also some of the properties that we've um, acquired. Um, you know, that's really what we focus on, right? It's about the business plan. It's about really taking, you know, what you said you can do on paper, but actually implementing it. And we have, you know, results within our properties of achieving, you know, whether it's expenses or rents that we said that we were going to do on the pro forma, you know, that's really what drives the business plan forward, right? So, you know, if someone is looking for someone who's willing to um, hustle, someone that's willing to really take no, <laughs> not take no for an answer, um, and really drive the operational success within the property and then also bring capital to the deal as well from a capital raising perspective, you know, I'm that guy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Good stuff. And and we met at a at a meetup and, and I found you uh, on LinkedIn a fair bit. Uh, LinkedIn is a great way to, to reach me anyway. Uh, uh, what What's the best way for, for somebody in the audience to get connected with you, Yannick? Yeah, so the best way is at my website. It's uh, Merlin, M-E-R, L Y N N as in Nancy Nancy acquisitions with an S dot com. So it's Merlin acquisitions dot com. You can reach out to me via email Y Cujo Y C U D J O E at Merlin acquisitions dot com. And one of the, the best things that you know that I can do today to provide value uh, from my asset management ex expertise and just my real estate expertise is to give your listeners a free due diligence checklist, right? Go to that website, download a free checklist, and you can use that today to go acquire your next multifamily asset. So thank you so much, Dan. This was really exciting and, uh, and um, you know, I appreciate it. All right. Awesome. I only have one other thing and it's actually not for you. It's for you in the audience, which is I got I got something terrible. It's terrible to tell you. It's, it's under my left hand. There's this big, awful red button. And it, frankly, it's embarrassing because it's ugly. It's an ugly button. And the only way to get rid of that awful, ugly red button is to click on it and it'll turn gray. And that gray button of tranquility, that magical button, its powers are it means that YouTube will start to pay for these videos instead of me and it's better but all jokes aside the real truth is it just means that my videos will show up uh it might show up anyway on your list of suggestions but you can go ahead and ignore those that's totally fine because hitting that button is plenty for me and i'm just glad that you were watching today and yannick thank you so much for joining me today this has been fantastic getting to know you better awesome I had a great time thank you Awesome. Hey, thanks for watching this episode of Chance Encounters. Make sure you 506B me after this. The way that that works and the way it works for you is if you're at a live event, all you need is your QR code that is uh, bookmarked. If you bookmark your own page on 506B me, then all that has to happen, somebody has to take their QR code scanner and they just do one of these, beep. And then what happens is when you log into your own 506B me account, it automatically just adds that person to your watch list. And then that way you can, when you get back to your hotel room or your house or whatever, you can watch those videos and make sure that you have that level of compliance that I'm hoping for. Anyway, 506B me after this. Thanks for watching. Bye.